Hi everyone! This video is an introduction to photosynthesis. This is a process that most of you have heard of before, and the purpose of this video is to provide some background information about photosynthesis and a general introduction so that you will be prepared to learn more about the details in class. So let's start with an overview. As you probably already know, photosynthesis is a process used by plants to make their own food. And as you'll remember, organisms that can make their own food are referred to as autotrophs. So plants are autotrophs. What they accomplish in photosynthesis is converting sunlight energy into chemical energy in the form of sugars. In class, we've been talking a lot about energy in the last couple of weeks, different forms of energy and how energy gets converted between one form and another. So let's put this in context by going all the way back to the main energy molecule that all cells need, which is ATP. As we learned in class, ATP powers reactions in cells by phosphorylating other molecules, giving up its last phosphate. And then it becomes ADP plus that free phosphate. And this process is what provides energy for all of the work that has to happen in cells. In order to recycle ATP, energy is needed to put that phosphate back on the ADP. So this is our ATP cycle that all cells use in order to power whatever's going on inside them. In class, we learned about where this energy comes from to attach this phosphate back onto the ADP. We pull apart glucose and harvest high energy electrons in order to create a hydrogen ion gradient to run ATP synthase that can put the phosphate back on ADP. And that's the process of cellular respiration. So these two cycles go together. But now it begs the question, where does this glucose come from in the first place? And that's where photosynthesis comes into it. So photosynthesis is the process in which plants use sunlight energy to create this glucose and provide the energy to run cellular respiration and therefore the ATP cycle. So all of these processes are linked together because all cells need ATP and many, many cells use the process of cellular respiration to recycle their ATP. If photosynthesis is providing the glucose, that means that the sun is the source of energy from almost every life form on Earth. So plants have a really important role in providing glucose and usable chemical energy to all the other creatures on Earth that need to use it to recycle their ATP. The next thing you need to know is where does photosynthesis take place? And many of you will probably remember that it takes place inside the chloroplasts in plant cells. So if we take a look at a plant cell here and all these organelles that you've learned, down there is the chloroplast, which is responsible for photosynthesis. If we look at plant cells under the microscope, you can see the individual box-like cells. And inside each one, you can see these little green blobs. Those are the chloroplasts. Let's take a closer look at chloroplasts and their structure. On the very outside of the chloroplast, this outer layer here is the outer membrane. The next layer in is the inner membrane. And like the mitochondrion, there's a space between them known as the intermembrane space. And again, this is intermembrane with a T. That means it's the space between the membranes. If we keep going further into the chloroplast, deep inside, there's a liquid known as the stroma. This is an aqueous fluid, a water-based fluid filled with salts, proteins, and enzymes. And this is sort of like the cytosol of the chloroplast. And you can see that there are other structures in there too. There are these flattened green discs called thylakoids. And you can see that these thylakoids are arranged in stacks. So we have a name for the stacks also. Each stack of thylakoids is called a granome. And you can see there are several stacks. So if you're referring to several of them, the plural form is grana. We can go even deeper into the chloroplast and go inside a thylakoid, and that space in there is known as the lumen. So these are all the parts of the chloroplast that you need to know. Make sure you have these in your notes and that you can identify and label them if needed. While we're here, I want to remind you also about the origin of chloroplasts that we talked about a few videos ago. Like mitochondria, we believe that the origin of chloroplasts in modern eukaryotic cells was through this process called endosymbiosis, which we've seen before. So just as a reminder, this is the process by which a precursor eukaryotic cell may have engulfed a smaller cell, in this case a photosynthetic bacterium, using the process of endocytosis. Under normal circumstances, it would have digested it for food and energy, but for whatever reason, at some point in time, there was one photosynthetic bacterium or maybe a few that didn't get broken down and instead kept living inside the cell. 
And because it worked out well for both of them, they developed a symbiotic relationship and it persists to this day with many larger cells having these little green things inside them that still behave a lot like photosynthetic bacteria, but they live together. So those are chloroplasts. What else do plants need for photosynthesis? Well, you know they need sunlight and you probably also remember that they need carbon dioxide and water. So if we put all these things together, we can come up with an overall equation for photosynthesis. So plants will take carbon dioxide and water and transform them into a sugar and oxygen. If we want to balance this equation, we have six carbons here, so we need six carbon dioxides. We have 12 hydrogens here, so we need six waters. And then to balance the rest of our oxygens, we need six there. You may recognize that this is the opposite of the balanced equation for cellular respiration. And essentially what's happening here is that plants are taking the atoms in the carbon dioxide and the water, these carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, and they're rearranging them and creating new bonds between them to make this sugar molecule. So if we take a closer look at each one of these reactants and products, we'll start with the carbon dioxide, which comes from the atmosphere. This is available in the air all around the plant, and it gets into the plant via diffusion. The way it gets in is through a special type of pore called stomata. So if you take a very close look at the underside of a leaf under a microscope, you might be able to see some tiny little holes that look like this. And those are the stomata. They are the pores through which the carbon dioxide can enter. And it just diffuses in based on a concentration gradient. The water, however, comes from the soil. So it enters the plant at the roots and it moves into the roots via the process of osmosis. So once again, based on concentration gradients. The main product of photosynthesis is glucose. And this is a wonderful, versatile product because plants can actually do a lot of different things with glucose. So as we already know, glucose can be broken down via cellular respiration to produce ATP. And plants absolutely do this. They need ATP. So that's one thing they can do with glucose. But they can also store glucose as starch. They can put together many glucoses using these alpha glycosidic linkages to produce starch molecules to store the sugar for later. Or if they put it together in a different way, they can make the glucoses into cellulose. So again, cellulose is many glucoses combined with these beta glycosidic linkages. And if a plant builds cellulose, then it can make new cell walls, build new cells, build new tissue, and actually grow. So from making this one product, glucose, plants can get energy, store energy, and build new plant. It's a really amazing product. And finally, the oxygen. This is a waste product. And like the carbon dioxide, it moves in and out via diffusion. So oxygen that's produced is just going to be able to diffuse out of the leaves through these same stomata, these little holes on the underside of the leaves. Now you may have noticed this little asterisk up here. The reason I put that there is to call your attention to the fact that this equation is not entirely accurate. It's a little more complicated than this in real life. So I did mention that these atoms in the carbon dioxide and water are rearranged to make a sugar here. But it takes a lot of energy to build those new bonds and put everything together. So I want to show you a little bit more about what actually is happening in photosynthesis. But this is the equation that you should know. So if I ask you to write out a balanced equation for photosynthesis, please write this one here. But in the meantime, let's take a closer look. So if we want to see what actually happens in photosynthesis, plants are using carbon dioxide and water, but they also need a fair amount of ATP and high energy electrons in order to build the products. And the actual product of photosynthesis is not technically glucose, but rather a molecule called G3P. This is a three carbon sugar, and it's a precursor to glucose. So plants will put together molecules of G3P to build glucose after photosynthesis. But going back to this idea of the ATP and the high energy electrons, it takes a lot of energy to do this process. So where is that energy coming from? You may have guessed, that's where the sunlight comes in. So the electrons get energized, and along the way the ATP gets created using sunlight energy. So we want to know how. How is that sunlight energy getting used? So the way that plants absorb sunlight energy is by using molecules called pigments. You've probably heard this word before, and if someone says pigment, you might think of colors, different colors, and that's fairly accurate. Pigments are molecules that can absorb and reflect specific frequencies or colors of light. So for this example here, we have a blue pigment, and you can see many colors of light that are 
coming down and hitting it, but because it's blue, the reason it looks blue to us is because it is reflecting blue light. So that's a general way that, that pigments and colors work, but photosynthetic pigments are really special. They can do something a little bit different because they have special electrons that can be bumped up to a higher energy state by a specific frequency or color of light. So here's a generalized model of an atom. You can see the nucleus, and here are some electrons in different orbitals. And if this were a photosynthetic pigment, it would have special electrons that, if they got just the right color or frequency of light, would be able to jump up to a higher energy state or a higher orbital. So this is how plants create those high energy electrons that they use in photosynthesis. And there are several different kinds of photosynthetic pigments. So as you know, not all plants are the same color. So they're using lots of different pigments. Plants can be green or purplish or reddish or pinkish and other colors too. But the most important photosynthetic pigment is one known as chlorophyll. And this is used by all plants. They all have this chlorophyll molecule and it appears green. It looks green to us. So in this diagram here, we see the full spectrum of visible light going from violet to red. So our x-axis is the frequency or the color of the light. And here on our y-axis, we're seeing how much of each color chlorophyll absorbs. You can see there's a couple different kinds of chlorophyll, the white and the black lines. But in both cases, they're absorbing a lot of purplish light and a lot of the orange-red light, but not so much of the green. So they absorb these colors here, but they're not absorbing the green. The green actually gets reflected, and that's what we see. So the reason chlorophyll looks green is because plants are absorbing the blue-purple and red-orange light, but reflecting the green light. Another way to show it, here we've got some chlorophyll. Sunlight is hitting it, and again, sunlight includes all the frequencies, all the colors of visible light but green is the only one that's really getting reflected. So that's why it looks green to us. And this chlorophyll is found embedded in the thylakoid membranes of plants. So this is why those thylakoids look green. It's because they contain chlorophyll. The actual process of photosynthesis occurs in two different phases. You can see here they are in this diagram here. So the first phase is known as the light reactions, also referred to as the light dependent reactions. And these occur at the thylakoid membrane. It's a series of reactions that are kind of going on across that thylakoid membrane. These do require sunlight, as you can see here. And as we mentioned earlier in the video, it's the sunlight energy that's being used to produce ATP and high energy electrons. The second phase then is known as the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle. And these occur in the stroma of the chloroplast, that liquid inside the chloroplast. This phase does not require sunlight because it's using the ATP and the high energy electrons from the light reactions to create the sugars, the final products. So electrons are being energized in the light reactions and used in the Calvin cycle. But as we learned in our cellular respiration unit, it's not really safe to have electrons just whizzing around in the cell. So once again, we're going to need a special carrier molecule to transport them safely between the phases. In cellular respiration, there was NAD and FAD. Photosynthesis has a slightly different molecule that's known as NADP. You can remember it as the NAD for photosynthesis, so you can just put a P on the end for photosynthesis. So that's a general introduction to photosynthesis. In class, we're gonna go into much more detail on each of these two phases. So until next time, take care of yourself, take care of each other.